Thanks, Alex. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Marissa McMahon uh, to our lecture series. Uh, Marissa is the Directory of Fisheries at Manomet, which is an NGO that does both um, scientific research and the application of science to a variety of questions of sustainability issues. And uh, Dr. McMahon has been working for over a decade on fisheries in the Gulf of Maine, and she focuses almost entirely on restoring ecosystem productivity and strengthening, strengthening and diversifying fisheries resources. So she uh, finished her PhD a uh, few years back from Northeastern working on the ecology and socioeconomics of Northern range expansion in black sea bass. Uh, she's got a deep connection with fishing tradition, uh, traditions and culture in New England in large part because her family's been fishing in the mid coast of Maine since the 1700s. So Dr. McMahon grew up in her father's lobster boat and spent much of her young adult life as a commercial lobster fisher. And much of her work uh, focuses on commercially important species and it's often designed to inform fisheries, stock assessments and management. And she's also working to develop new fisheries and markets for undervalued or underused species and sometimes even for exotic invasive species such as the European green crab. And you'll hear a little bit about that work today. Uh, thank you very much for coming, Dr. McMahon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing. Um, and thank you for that great introduction. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about Manomet and my background, but you definitely set the stage. So I will, uh, I'll jump right in. Um, so I'm going to start just uh, with a quick outline of, of sort of what uh, the talk is going to focus on. I'm realizing that I can't advance my slides though. <laughs> Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, so so just a, a quick outline of, of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start with some historic context where I attempt to walk you through 400 years of fisheries history in the U.S. in about two minutes, um, and then talk a little bit about uh, what fisheries management looks like today, uh, and then I'm going to use the Gulf of Maine as a case study for the evolution of fisheries and fisheries management, and then we'll sort of wrap it all up. Um, so, so starting with that historic context, just to set the scene, um, I, I want to first and foremost point out when whenever we talk about historical fishing in the U.S., it's really important to note that Native Americans sustainably harvested marine resources in this country for thousands of years. Um, and so we have, you know, records and oral histories that really document the sustainable harvest of our marine resources by Native peoples. Um, however, 400 years ago, European settlers arrived in this country and quickly discovered fish resources that were more plentiful than they had ever seen. Um, and so uh, we see that ground fishing becomes the first colonial industry in America. It's a key industry upon which this country was built. And for hundreds of years, more and more settlers arrived, more fish were harvested, more boats were sent to sea, and we become more and more efficient, essentially, at capturing fish. By the 1930s, we see that there's advances in technology that lead to increased fishing efficiency, so more and more <clears throat> fish being harvested, and stocks can no longer sustain the growth in landings, so we start to see populations begin to decline. And then in the 1940s and 50s, we actually see fisheries science emerge as a profession, and we start to see things like quota systems arising as a way to control harvest and fishing gear restrictions and other sorts of regulatory and management structures. Uh, in the 1960s, we see increased pressure from the international fleet, uh, these large, large international boats that were called floating fish factories. Uh, and these were large vessels that could take hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish in a single night. Uh, and so in 1976, Congress actually enacted the Magnuson Act, which establishes an exclusive economic zone over US waters out to 200 miles from shore. So essentially excluding that international fleet from this 200 mile buffer around uh, United States shorelines. <clears throat> 
And then in the 1970s and 80s, we see that stocks begin to rebound slightly because of that reduced pressure from the international fleet. And in response to that, the US doubles down and invests heavily in our domestic fleet. Uh, and so by the time we get to the 1990s and early 2000s, we see that stocks have really declined to the lowest levels in recorded history. So uh, this is just sort of a graphical way to look at what I just walked you through. Um, so we can see this is showing a steep decline in ground fish in particular from 1950 to 2012. But really, this trend started almost 400 years ago. So this is a pretty bleak story uh, and you know, not always the most <laughs> exciting start to a talk. Uh, it's a little depressing, but um, you know, we can see sort of in retrospect, some of the areas where we did things wrong and we can improve upon how we manage and harvest fish. Um, so amongst all of this also, you can find success stories. Um, it wasn't all necessarily um, these sort of catastrophic um, collapse of fish stocks. So while ground fish were collapsing, we actually see that lobsters were thriving. And so this is a figure showing lobster landings in the state of Maine from the 1960s to present. And despite increased fishing pressure on the lobster stock, we also see that the population increased. So um, it, we do see in this figure uh, a slight downturn in recent years and just the, the, the last five years or so. But um, this is actually looking at landings data. And so this trend is actually more reflective of reduced effort that that downturn in recent years is reduced effort rather than a reduced population size of lobsters. So I wanna just briefly look at some of the reasons why this happened. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, you know, one of the things that is, um, you know, quite obvious is that while we see lobsters increasing, we also see those large ground fish decreasing. So those ground fish are predators of lobsters. And so by taking more and more of those fish out of the water and reducing those populations, we actually eliminated a lot of predation of lobsters. But that's actually not considered the main driver of the success of the lobster fishery. Um, another really important factor is that this fishery is very territorial. So lobster fishers have very specific territories that they fish in, and if and when they step over the line, so to speak, they have their own ways of policing and enforcement. And this really discourages people from getting too greedy. There also has been really effective co-management of the resource from the early stages of the fishery. So that means that fishers are actively involved in the management of the fishery and the species uh, and the species they have some control over how the fishery is regulated. So there are examples from around the world of how this actually leads to more effective management, this, this idea of co-management that the fishers are involved in. And then lastly, and most importantly, there has been an effective conservation uh, measures, effective conservation measures and um, ethic within the fishery. And often that's been self-imposed by the industry. And this has been occurring since the early 1900s. So this incl includes things like uh, protecting the large breeding lobsters, protecting the young juveniles. So essentially they throw back the big ones, they throw back the little ones. Um, limiting effort through gear regulations and a, a strict licensing system. So lots of different examples of how the fishery has self-imposed these sorts of conservation measures, and that is why it has led to this flourishing sustainable fishery. So within this context, we can see that while there were a lot of actions over the course of the past 400 years that led to over-exploitation and collapse of once abundant stocks, there are also fisheries that should and are held up as an example of success and sustainable management. So where are we now in terms of fisheries management? Well, it's a very complex interaction of biology, ecology, socioeconomics, and politics. Um, and so I'm going to show you sort of a, a diagram of, of the gradual uh, progression of fisheries management. Um, over the past several decades. 
So on the bottom here, this is basically the, the sort of bottom of where we started from in terms of managing fisheries. So this is managing a single fish stock in isolation based solely on its biology. So essentially we're managing a fish stock as if it were living in a bubble and not impacted by anything else. Um, and this doesn't work, right? There are too many other factors that impact fish populations that need to be accounted for. So we then evolve to manage a single stock within the context of the ecosystem. So we started to consider how climate and habitat and predators might be impacting a fish stock. But this still isn't enough. So currently what we're striving for is what's called ecosystem-based management, where we manage units of fish instead of just single species in isolation. So essentially we're accounting for the fact that fish interact with each other, they don't exist in bubbles. Um, and so instead of just managing one single species by itself, we're managing units of species. So for instance, a unit of, of species for ground fish could have cod and pollock and haddock, all fish that use similar habitat and have similar sort of biology and, and dietary constraints and things like that. Um, and then we manage that unit within the context of climate and habitat and predators and other sort of ecosystem impacts. However, where we really hope to be going in the future is to manage fish, fish stocks in the context of all other possible uses of the ocean that interact with the health of the stock. And this could really range from things like offshore wind to oil and gas production to ecotourism to fish farming, et cetera. But it's really only when we account for all of these different impacts that we can truly understand the health and productivity of a fish stock and design regulations that achieve sustainable harvest. So switching gears a bit, I'm going to talk about a specific place called the Gulf of Maine and use this as a case study for the evolution of fisheries. Um, and, and with a little less emphasis on fisheries management, but we will talk about that a, a, a bit. Um, but more emphasis on the actual fish and what we're seeing in this region. Um, so the Gulf of Maine, just to orient folks, is this sort of semi-enclosed sea uh, that borders Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, and Nova Scotia. So you can see that sort of uh, shallow area in the map. Um, and, and really the Gulf of Maine, what it used to look like can be sort of envisioned like this. Um, and so essentially what we had were very, very abundant resources, diverse and productive fisheries, and many species supporting many different fisheries, and then a system that supported effort being spread amongst all of these fisheries, instead of just focused on a few species. And so what I mean by that is that we had a system of small scale seasonal fisheries. So for instance, you could fish for cod and halibut in the spring, and then switch to fishing for lobster and tuna and clams in the summer, and then switch to shrimp and scallops in the fall and winter, et cetera. And so instead of just fishing for the same species year round. And this was a very sustainable way for small scale fisheries to operate. But if we fast forward to the present and look at what our fishery systems look like today. Uh, this figure here is looking at the value of commercial species in Massachusetts in 2019. And this is a pie chart and you can obviously see that one piece of the pie is much bigger than the rest. So what we actually see is that 75% of the value of commercial landings in Massachusetts comes from just two species, scallops and lobsters. If we look to Maine, uh, we see an even more dire situation. So this is looking at the value of commercial fisheries in Maine in 2020. We actually see 79% of the value is derived from just one species. So this is not a good situation to be in. If you've ever heard the phrase, all of your eggs are in one basket, that is what's happening here. Right, And if that basket were to drop, or if anything were to happen to either of these two species, we would see a, a real collapse of the entire fisheries system. Now, if that's not precarious enough, 
we also find ourselves in a period of immense environmental change. So the Gulf of Maine is actually warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. So this figure is showing warming trends since 1990. And then the last part of the figure shows the expected warming trends through 2050. So we're seeing immense and accelerated warming in the Gulf of Maine. And this warming is altering the very structure and function of the ecosystem. And this can really be seen in the distribution and abundance of species. So for instance, this is a species called Northern shrimp, which is a cold water loving species and has all but disappeared from the Gulf of Maine. This was once an incredibly important fishery, but a moratorium was enacted in 2014, which essentially closes the fishery down. And that continues to the present day. We likely won't ever see this fishery rebound because the water is simply too warm for this species to thrive now. We also see Atlantic cod, which were once common in shallow coastal waters, moving deeper and moving to places where they can find cooler water. So changing their habitat use and changing where we can actually uh, uh, locate and target and fish for them. Um, even the very base of the food chain is being impacted. So this is a planktonic species called a copepod. And many, many species rely on this tiny organism for food, but po uh, uh, copepods rather are shifting north and shifting away from warming water. And so two species in particular to note that are being impacted by this are lobsters, which of course are a very important fishery for the Gulf of Maine, and also right whales, which are an endangered species. Both uh, of these species rely on this copepod at various life stages. Um, we're also seeing invasive species thriving in warming waters. So unfortunately, a lot of the species that seem to uh, like this warming water and, and be you know, thriving and, and doing really well are invasive species. So this is the European green crab. Um, it's really wreaking havoc on our ecosystem. It's a voracious predator of native bivalves and it also is really uh, destructive to important coastal habitats. And we're seeing them become more and more abundant as the water warms. And then finally, we're also seeing warm water species that were once rare or absent in the Gulf of Maine becoming much more abundant as the water warms. So things like squid and scup and black sea bass and cohogs. So there's really these rippling effects throughout the entire ecosystem because of this immense amount of environmental change that we're experiencing so rapidly. So what does this mean for the future and what does the future look like? Well, let's just take a step back once more and, and take a, a look, a snapshot at, at what the past looked like, right? So again, very diverse, a lot of abundant resources supporting a lot of different fisheries. Um, and then let's take a realistic look at what the present looks like. Um, we do see that, you know, there's two species really holding this entire system up, scallops and lobsters. Um, I do want to point out, though, that there are other success stories of species like halibut and haddock and tuna and river herring, which have rebounded due to successful management and conservation. But this system is still at just about the lowest point of diversity that it's ever been at in terms of fisheries. And so we still need to be working towards restoring that diversity. And I'd like to propose that we can do that. It just won't look exactly the same as it used to look, right? So some species are going to be the same. Some of the fisheries will be the same, but most of them will be different moving forward. And we'll have fisheries that target things like newly emerging warm water species, things like black sea bass and squid and scup. Uh, we'll have fisheries that target invasive, undervalued, or underutilized species. And we'll also see aquaculture becoming a much more important piece of the puzzle and becoming part of a diversification strategy for fisheries. So I want to talk about each one of these strategies that I've just mentioned in a little more detail. And I'll first start with this, uh, this strategy or idea of utilizing invasive, undervalued, or underutilized species. Um, so these are just some examples pictured here of such species. Things like dogfish, redfish, Jonah crabs, the invasive green crab that we just talked about, 
and whelks. So all things that are abundant and can be sustainably harvested and are very nutritious animal protein. Um, but it takes more than just shifting to harvesting this, these species, right? So fishers have to be able to make a living. And so there has to be some sort of market incentive to fish for these types of, of seafood. And that means consumers have to want to eat it. So there's a huge amount of effort right now being focused on education and outreach to consumers about new types of seafood, um, it, you know, underutilized, undervalued invasive species that could perfectly um, serve as sources of animal protein and, and delicious sources of seafood on your dinner plate. Um, so I just want to uh, quickly use a, an example of a place where we have actually seen this sort of shift occur and be successful. So uh, looking to our neighbors in the south in Rhode Island, what we actually have seen um, in Rhode Island is that the, the state used to be very dependent on the lobster fishery. Um, so this figure is actually looking at the abundance of lobsters landed from 1979 to 2013. And you can see huge increases in abundance until the late 90s, and then really a total collapse of the fishery. Um, I, I do want to point out that this is a very different fishery from the Gulf of Maine lobster fishery that I talked about earlier, which has been very successful and has been managed sustainably. Um, this Rhode Island fishery, there, there's a few really important differences that really had to um, do with sort of the, the different fates of these two fisheries. The first is conservation. So in Rhode Island, they didn't practice the same sort of conservation where they threw back the breeding lobsters, threw back the small juveniles, um, and that had a, a major impact on the health of the population. And then Rhode Island is also much warmer than the Gulf of Maine. And so lobsters are really at the southernmost extent of their range in areas like Rhode Island. So even a little bit of warming has really had devastating impacts on the population there. But regardless of that, the bottom line is that the fishery collapsed and people thought that that was really going to be the end of the fishing way of life in Rhode Island. But that's not what happened. Uh, instead, what we saw was that fishers pivoted and started harvesting other species. In some instances, things that they used to consider trash fish, um, like scup, or things like Jonah crabs and squid that they just never had any interest in fishing for. Um, I was actually on a panel with a fisherman from Rhode Island a few years ago, um, and he'd been fishing for over 40 years at the time. And he said something that really hit home. He said, these are some of my best years fishing. I just never would have expected what it is I'm fishing for. And so these fishers in Rhode Island suffered through the collapse of their primary fishery, but were still able to pivot and begin harvesting and, and you know, take opportunity from these new species and these sort of underutilized species. And you know, that takes more than just switching from one species to another. It takes a lot of effort on the marketing side of things as well. And so that's really been part of the success of this story is that there's been you know, marketing and, and sort of public outreach campaigns so that people are looking for Jonah crab and scup and squid on their dinner plate. Um, so I think we can learn a lot from what we saw happen in Rhode Island. And it gives me hope that in the Gulf of Maine, we will be able to continue to pivot and diversify and shift to new species. So the next, uh, the next theme is taking advantage of emerging new species. And so these are things that were once rare because the Gulf of Maine was too cold. So the figure on the left is showing the latitudinal shift in the center of stock biomass for four different species. That essentially just means the center of stock biomass is where the species is most abundant. So what we're seeing here, um, the, the, the figure shows lobster in the top left figure, uh, yellowtail flounder on the top right, uh, summer flounder on the bottom left, and red hake on the bottom right. And so what we see for lobster is that they're shifting further north within the Gulf of Maine, but these other three species, these are actually mid-Atlantic species that historically were not abundant in the Gulf of Maine or just didn't exist in the Gulf of Maine at all. 
So what we're seeing is these species are actually shifting from their historical mid-Atlantic habitat up into the Gulf of Maine. Um, and these are all potential lucrative new fisheries. There are many examples of this. These are just a few here. Some other really prominent ones are squid, black sea bass, and blue crabs. Um, again, all things that were once rare in the Gulf of Maine, but are moving north with climate change, with warming waters. And these are all potential new fisheries that we can be benefiting from. And then last but not least, aquaculture. So uh, this figure here is showing uh, the production of fish from wild harvest in blue and from uh, aquaculture in yellow since the 1950s. And it shows it till about 2010 and then projects to the future. So it's the figure is a little bit outdated. Um, but essentially what you're seeing is that aquaculture production has steadily increased in the past few decades, while wild capture fisheries have really leveled off. And aquaculture is expected to become more and more important to seafood production in the coming decades. And this presents an opportunity for fishers to diversify. So if we look on a much more local scale, this is a figure um, looking at the um, increasing trend in the number of oysters farmed in Maine since the early 2000s. So we're seeing a steady increase in the number of oysters produced and the value of those oysters. Um, a really interesting sort of side story from my own hometown in Georgetown, Maine. So in, in Georgetown, we are primarily a town of lobster fishers and clam harvesters. We haven't historically had aquaculture in Georgetown. Um, but three years ago, the town realized that we needed to diversify fishing opportunities if this was going to be a viable way of life in the future. And so, our, you know, our clam populations in particular have decreased. Our lobster populations are projected to do so in the coming decades as waters warm. So in response to this, we formed an aquaculture co-op. And now there are a dozen different fishers growing oysters in Georgetown. And most of them still catch lobsters or dig clams, but the oysters are providing a much needed security net and a way to diversify and become more resilient to climate change impacts. So just a few other examples of some aquaculture that we're seeing currently um, become more and more prominent in the Gulf of Maine. We're seeing a lot of seaweed aquaculture. Seaweed aquaculture presents a really great opportunity in particular for lobster fishers because seaweed is grown in the cold winter months when a lot of lobster fishers uh, either slow down their operations or you know, stop entirely. And so this is sort of a, a, a seasonal you know, winter um, um, diversification opportunity. We're seeing things like American eels um, being grown in aquaculture settings, uh, scallops, um, oysters, of course, mussels. So there's a whole host of different um, species that are now being grown and that are potential diversification strategies for the fishers in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so just to wrap up, um, we are currently at a really critical point in the evolution of fisheries and fisheries management. Um, the combined effects of hundreds of years of exploitation and mismanagement and rapid climate change induced change is seemingly pushing us to a breaking point. And while mitigation is of course of the utmost importance, um, reducing carbon footprint and finding ways to sequester carbon, et cetera, um, you know, mitigation isn't going to slow down the warming that we're seeing in the Gulf of Maine in the immediate future. So we have to be thinking about adaptation. We have to be thinking about how we continue to thrive both our ecosystems and our fisheries and coastal communities. And a lot of that is really um, through this diversification, this idea of having a fishery system that looks much more like it did 50, 60, or 100 years ago, where we have a lot of different species supporting small-scale seasonal fisheries um, and, and a sustainable fishing system that also promotes our ecosystems and promotes our fish stocks. So uh, with that, I will stop talking and I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thank you very much, Marissa. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, they can type them into the Q&A um, and we'll start with Michael. 
But I'll I'll start out with one that I'm concerned about is do you see most of the issues being a lack of science or is most of the issue working with people or is it creating markets and what's what's the bottleneck from your perspective in um, a smooth transition to a warming climate for the fisheries in Maine? Well, it's a little of all of those things. <laughs> um, so I will say, uh, you know, I think that in the past with sort of more of our historical fisheries, um, you know, a lot of it has been a, a lack of science and a lack of data um, and, and just fully understanding sort of the entire ecosystem. And, and again, you know, back to that sort of diagram I showed, we used to manage fish like they existed in a bubble and nothing else interacted with them. And so a lot of the sort of management that was put in place in the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s ended up failing just because we weren't accounting for all of the different things that impact a fish stock. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we're moving in a direction where we're strengthening that management and we're taking into account, I mean, even it was like a big deal for fishery stock assessment to start incorporating temperature, <laughs> you know, like some of, some of the stock assessments still don't even incorporate temperature. Um, and so, you know, baby steps, we're moving in the direction to incorporate more data and more information and a better understanding. But that is then complicated by how quickly things are changing. And so for, you know, some fish stocks like black sea bass, they shifted their center of stock biomass in like a matter of four or five years. It happens so quickly. And, you know, for the management, management works on a scale of, you know, usually a stock assessment and new management regulations happen every four to six years. So this fish stock shifted you know, faster than management could keep pace, faster than science could keep pace. We didn't even have the tools in place to fully understand how quickly this species moved. So part of it is, you know, also projecting what we expect will happen and trying to, you know, put into place the monitoring or the data collection tools or protocols that we'll need as we expect to see these species continuing to move. And to the other, you know, part of your, your question, the, the marketing is also a huge part of it because people have a very clear idea in their mind of what seafood is and what they like to eat and what they like to see on the menu. And I think, you know, part of it is just that sort of outreach and education to sort of broaden people's, uh, you know, understanding of seafood and, and provide experiences where people can experiment with, you know, trying new seafood or, um, you know, have, you know, just opportunities to, to be able to sort of put that information out there. Um, so, you know, I think it's this, this sort of holistic approach to thinking about these, these issues. And I will just say, um, the last thing I'll say on that is uh, NOAA, so the, the, uh, body that the federal management body for fisheries is actually right now doing conducting scenario planning. So they've had several different workshops where essentially the idea is that they, you know, project several different scenarios, maybe like 10 different scenarios that could occur. And the, the ones that we've been doing recently have focused really just on the East Coast and then think about for all of these different scenarios, you know, whether it's two degrees of warming or a half degree of warming or sea level rise or whatever the scenario is, how we should react to that so that we can start thinking about some of the, the sort of things that we need to have in place to prepare for these types of scenarios in the future. And so, you know, that's a move in the right direction at least, and hopefully, you know, allows us to be a little bit more adaptive in the future. I have a question. Um, very different here. Um, so it seems like fishermen are definitely playing a key role for a successful management strategy since they are at the center. <clears throat> so I was wondering first, what kind of input do they have in when management policies are set? And second, <clears throat> I wonder about what kind of uh, support uh, safety net that they have in order to be more resilient if they are to change, diversify 
I'm just thinking about the example you gave, for example, on the mortgage screen. I don't know, I'm gonna fish around myself. Um, so I don't know how difficult it is to switch species just like that. And is there any mechanism to support that? Any, anything you can contribute would be really interesting. Yeah, b uh, both very great questions. So to the first part, um, <laughs> fishers sort of interacting with management. Um, so the amount of knowledge that a fisher has about the environment where they fish is just, you, you can't replicate it. Um, so it's, it's such a fine scale, you know, observational, uh, you know, collection of information. They're on the water every single day. They are experiencing these changes firsthand and we cannot replicate that in the world of science, right? Like we are just constrained in a way that we can't be on the water every single day. And so being able to elevate the importance of those observations and be able to incorporate that into management is really important. And we're really just at the very beginning of trying to do that. So I actually work on the black sea bass stock assessment um, for, the, for the northern stock that ranges from North Carolina to the Gulf of Maine. And for the very first time in this stock assessment this year, we're interviewing fishers, black sea bass fishers, and we're collecting their observations and collecting information that can then be fed into the stock assessment and can be both sort of ground truthing the science and the data, as well as informing the ultimate management decisions that are made. And so, you know, that in and of itself, just the observations are, are creating more information for us to make decisions with, but also it's elevating the importance of the fishers being part of the management system. It's allowing them to, to have a seat at that table and then that reflects back on sort of buy-in to the ultimate regulations that are decided on essentially. Um, and so that's sort of one of the ways that, that you know, I think we're moving in the direction of being able to, to have fishers participate in management at that level. Um, and I will just say again, back to the example of the lobster fishery, it's sort of a different story there because the fishers were the ones that, you know, basically self-imposed regulations within that fishery starting over a hundred years ago. And we see the evidence of how well that has actually worked with a fishery that is still thriving to this very day. So again, you know, just examples of where when fishers are at the table from the get-go in terms of thinking about management and regulations, it ultimately leads to, um, you know, the, these, these more sustainable outcomes essentially. Um, and then to your second question, so it, it, there's, there's a lot to that in terms of how you can create a system where it is easy to switch from one species to another. Part of it is on the management side of things, right? So often it's not very easy because a lot of these fisheries are closed to new entrants. So it's not as easy as saying, I fish for lobsters and now I want to fish for scallops, right? You can't go get a scallop license. That's a closed fishery. And so we also need to be reevaluating the very structure of our fishery system and how open or closed these types of fisheries are. And in some cases, you know, that's one of our best tools for managing a fishery and preventing overfishing. But when we're talking about undervalued or underutilized species, you know, we can make that sort of access to licenses and things like that. We can make that easier. We can make that more approachable. Um, and, I, and in terms of sort of the gear and, and you know, just the, the actual techniques that, that are, you know, employed or, or deployed rather for um, fishing, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing um, at Manamat are, are really testing sort of new techniques of fishing and trying to test techniques that are very adaptable and similar to things that fishers are already doing. So using similar gear, using similar fishing methods. So for the green crab work that we're doing, we basically are taking all of the gear that a lobster fisher would already have access to and testing that out for green crab fishing um, and, and essentially trying to really lower the barrier to switch <laughs> from one fishery to another, similar with black sea bass as well, um, you know, trying to figure out ways that, you know, a trap fishery could be very similar to the lobster fishery in the Gulf of Maine, and, and so using fish traps instead of lobster traps, and really trying to figure out ways that, you know, it, it is approachable and affordable and efficient for a fisher to switch from one fishery to another. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. So I have a bunch of questions that have come online. I'm going to keep us with the topic of livelihood to start with and then move to organizations and then we'll get to a series of questions on sustainability. So the first question is from Eugene Chakravorty. The increase in the share of aquaculture is interesting. <laughs> what do you think the government can do to reduce the negative effects of the shift in fishing due to climate change? And are the number of people in the sector staying the same over time? Um, I missed the very first part of that. Could you just repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, it was just that the increase in the share of aquaculture is interesting. So these are all around aquaculture. And okay. the questions, um, go ahead. Yeah, what yeah. Um, so, and I don't know if I'm interpreting the, the question entirely, but uh, it, it correctly, but um, I will say, so in terms of the increase in aquaculture, what we have seen is that the majority of it is new entrants entering into the fishery instead <clears throat> of what you know, we hope to see, which is fishers diversifying into aquaculture. We do see some of that. We do see some commercial fishers starting to use aquaculture as a diversification strategy. The majority of what we've seen, at least in the Gulf of Maine, is that most of the aquaculture growth has been from new entrants into the fishery or into, into aquaculture, essentially. Um, so, you know, in terms of the other part about what, sorry, would you repeat, there was a part about what can the government to... Yeah, um, I just cleared up the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what, do you, what do you think the government can do to reduce the negative effects of the shift in fishing due to climate change? Um, what's the perhaps the government's role to? Um, um, I, I understand the question to be what is the government's role to um, um, help along these these shifts? Um, no yeah, yeah. That, and that's definitely a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of funding for developing aquaculture is coming from the federal gov government right now. Um, and, you know, a lot of, so for instance, uh, the Sea Grant system is one of the big sort of proponents of developing aquaculture. And they're actually mandated by Congress to develop aquaculture in the United States. And so we're seeing, you know, a huge push on that front in terms of just funding being available for this type of work and, and a lot of support and a lot of infrastructure being built around, um, you know, either networking or, you know, gear sharing or, you know, all of these things that are meant to sort of take knowledge and technology transfer, all of these things that are sort of really meant to kind of lower the barriers to entry into aquaculture for new participants. Um, and, and a lot of, you know, research, uh, funding for research on new species that can be grown, new gear, new technologies. Um, and so, we're, you know, I would say we're seeing a huge amount of support uh, in terms of, you know, federal, federal dollars right now towards developing aquaculture. Um, what, the, what's not necessarily being looked at as closely is just ways specifically to get commercial fishers to in aquaculture. Um, and so I think that has something that it's just not had as much attention. And I think, you know, it's something that is on the radar of folks. And, and certainly for Manomat, our work is almost entirely in, in aquaculture is almost entirely focused on trying to develop techniques and growing strategies that are very approachable and adaptable to commercial fishers. Um, and I know that there's others that are also working in that space as well. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if that fully answers that one, but yeah. No, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Kathy Stanton. What are the key organizations or networks that have enabled fishers to self-organize and self-regulate? That's a great question. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of... Um, networks, at least at least sort of in more recent years and recent decades, there's a lot of sort of like industry advocacy groups. So I know, you know, in Maine, we have the Maine Lobstermen's Association, the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. And these are groups that speak for the industry and are, you know, available to provide capacity, essentially. I mean, these are organizations that have full-time paid staff that are just working on the, the issues that are being brought to them by the industry. Um, so that's, you know, I think one of the main sort of drivers. Um, 
but in the past, I would say, you know, again, going back to the, the lobster industry as an example, um, you know, part of the success of that industry is that it was so territorial and it was tied to place in a way that allowed it to be very sustainable. So your license is for a very specific area, right? There's zones along the coast, but even within the zones, you know, the coast of Maine is, is broken into zones A through G, I think it is. Um, even within those zones, I mean, you're even more limited by sort of your neighbors to a very specific harbor, even in some instances. And so that in and of itself is a way to sort of organize fishers on a very small scale according to where their fishing grounds are. And then also there's sort of that like unspoken agreement um, that keeps people from getting too greedy, right? Because if you start to cross over into these other areas that are not considered your territory, then, you know, there's things get taken into, <laughs> into um, uh, you know, the, the fisher's own hands, so to speak. Um, and it's, it's highly frowned upon to do that. And so that is just sort of all unspoken, you know, regulatory kind of frameworks that have arisen just because of the nature of that fishery. And it has in fact actually led to, you know, some of the success and sustainability of the fishery. Thank you. So I have two questions that have come in from Kirsten Skirm. Um, one, what gives you the confidence that these new fish species that are moving into the Gulf of Maine will not be overfished in the same manner? Um, you know, history repeating itself. And also, is there any concern that the invasive species moving in may deplete the local plants and base foods in the food chain and further push out any remaining local species? Yeah, uh, to the first uh, question. So that is again why it's so important for us to really, you know, do sort of the scenario planning, do sort of, you know, the projections of how we expect species to move so that we can already have in place the tools that we need to assess those populations. So um, for, just as an example, so for, I work a lot with black sea bass. And so black sea bass moved into the Gulf of Maine over the past decade. And we didn't have anything in place in the Gulf of Maine to monitor those fish in any way. And it's really important when you manage a fish stock to really understand the abundance of the, of the species, but also you know basic information about growth and sexual reproduction when they reach reproductive age you know, uh, fitness and, and condition of the fish and things like that, their diet. Uh, and so we, we didn't have access to any of that information because it was an entire species that we weren't used to sampling and collecting data on. And so we've kind of been playing catch up because essentially what happened is that we were then managing a species without any real biological information on it, which is a really risky thing to do. Um, and so, you know, part of it has just been trying to figure out how we can build up the tools that we need to effectively manage these new species by collecting data, by monitoring, by fully understanding. And a, a big part of that is also understanding observations from fishers, right? Scientists didn't know that black sea bass were in the Gulf of Maine until lobster fishermen started to tell them that they were catching them as bycatch in their traps. That's how we figured out that this range expansion was occurring. And so again, that, that sort of piece of really fully understanding the whole picture through both you know, scientific approaches of collecting data, but also understanding observations from fishers is hopefully leading us in a direction where we can you know, fully understand these new populations and manage them in a sustainable way. Um, and I, because I've been talking now, I forgot the second question. <laughs> The second question um, is whether there's concerns that the invasive species moving in may end up depleting local and, and, and base foods for the, the remaining local species. Yeah, um, yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's been a huge problem with green crabs in particular. They're not a new species in the Gulf of Maine. They've been here for, you know, 200 years or more. Um, because they're really thriving and increasing in abundance, they're just really decimating our native bivalve populations, things like softshell clams and mussels. Um, and so, you know, part of 
the idea of developing a fishery for an invasive species is this idea of mitigation, right? Is there some way that we can try to exert control on the population through creating a fishery, an incentive essentially for people to remove that species? Um, you know, brand new invasives that, you know, are, are coming in or, you know, potentially, uh, uh, there's also sort of a difference between invasive and emerging species. So like black sea bass didn't used to be in the Gulf of Maine, but we don't consider them an invasive species because they're simply expanding their range into the Gulf of Maine rather than being, you know, introduced or essentially, you know, displaced from an entirely different geography. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely new interactions that we need to account for because things like black sea bass or scup or some of the other species are predators of crustaceans, for example, right? Black sea bass eat lobsters. Um, there's just no getting away from that. And so really also understanding sort of what that means for food webs and what that means for, you know, the, the health of a stock is really important. And I would say that, that that is, again, going back to the management side of things, what we're really hoping to be moving towards is capturing, you know, if we're managing the lobster stock, we're not just managing lobsters like they are in their own isolated bubble, we're managing them by accounting for the fact that there are new predators move, of lobsters moving into the Gulf of Maine and fully understanding what that means for the abundance of the lobster population. Um, you know, I think we're not there yet, but we are moving in that direction. And so, you know, hopefully we can start accounting for invasives and emerging new species and how they impact our native species. Thank you. I've got, I've got a question from Elizabeth Hammond that I think come, comes right off here. So I've read a lot of doom and gloom about lobsters moving north away from iconic lobster fisheries. Um, do you anticipate a marketing shift towards crab to take advantage of that crustacean food culture? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's what we saw in Rhode Island. Um, you know, Rhode Island fishers, that was one of the easiest moves for them. They, you know, most of them having been lobster fishers their whole life, it was an easy move for them to switch to fishing for crabs because it's the exact same gear and you use the exact same fishing techniques. Um, and, and for that particular species of it was the, the Jonah crab, which we have in the Gulf of Maine as well, it was very easy to get a license because again, it had just been this underutilized, undervalued species for so long that it was, no one targeted it. It was still an open fishery. You could still easily acquire a license. And so I absolutely see that as being a really important part. Um, in the Gulf of Maine, we don't quite see the native crabs in as high of an abundance as they're seeing in Rhode Island right now but we're, we're seeing an increase. We have in recent years, in the past five to 10 years, we've been seeing those native crab species increasing. And so I absolutely think that that will be a really important part of how we diversify going forward. Thank you. We, we've posed a lot of questions at you. I've got one more, um, um, uh, kind of switching gears a little um, from Santa Noor. Looking at the future as offshore wind is gaining pace, how do you think it will affect the fisheries um, what are the potential challenges and benefits of offshore wind farms as seen by the fisheries management? Yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, there's definitely challenges and there's definitely opportunities. Um, you know, one of the interesting opportunities of offshore wind being developed is that it actually is, I mean, anytime that you put structure into the ocean, it's creating new habitat, essentially. And so um, what we've seen, uh, there's a, 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 I think five um, windmill, wind farm off of Block Island in Rhode Island. And I've talked a lot with the recreational fishers in that area and they love that wind farm because it is creating so much habitat for the species that they target. Um, and so that's, you know, recreational hook and line fishing. And so they've actually seen an increase in the abundance and diversity of fish species because those, that structure of those windmills is attracting, uh, you know, new species and more species to that habitat, artificial man-made habitat, but it's still habitat. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's interesting um, examples like that, but then you think about the, the folks that have fixed gear or that fish through dragging or, you know, any sort of nets, 
and they're not able to get near that area because of you know the, the regulatory framework around what types of gear you can use near wind farms so you know i think that it's it's definitely there's there's benefits there's downturns um it's sort of you know managing that it's sort of finding the balance of you know where we can site wind farms that have the least amount of impact on fishing um, or where we can site them in areas that are maybe, you know, in need of habitat, essentially, right? So there's places where, you know, adding new structure and new habitat would ultimately be beneficial. Um, I think it's really just being thoughtful about that and really listening to the fishing, fishing community as part of that process. I know here in Maine that we've had a lot of um, conversations and a lot of webinars and, and um, forums and opportunities for um, the folks who are proposing to develop offshore wind to be able to interact with the fishing community and hear feedback and understand sort of, you know, areas that might be um, ideal for targeting, uh, you know, that sort of project. Um, but it's certainly not, it's, it's, there's a lot of conflict and there's no sort of avoiding that, unfortunately. Well, I think we've come up to time. So if everyone could join me in thanking Marissa for a wonderful talk and, um, you know, such detailed and thoughtful answers to all these questions. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me again. This was wonderful. Thank you.